Welcome to Let's Learn Academy. I am Ashika Panikar and today we shall be studying History, Chapter Number 1 The Rise of Nationalism in Europe. So let us begin. In 1848, Frederick Sorel, a French artist, prepared a series of four prints visualizing his dream of a world made up of democratic and social republics, as he called them. The first print, which you can see in figure 1 of the series, shows the people of Europe and America, both men and women, of all ages and social classes, marching in a long train and offering homage to the Statue of Liberty as they pass by it. As you could recall, artists of the time of the French Revolution personified liberty as a female figure. Unke liye liberty ka matlab symbolize karne ke liye wo ek female figure ko dekhte the. Here you can recognize the torch of enlightened, enlightenment she bears in one hand and the charter of rights of man in the other. In Soru's Ethiopian vision, Ethiopian means uh, a vision of society that is so ideal that it is unlikely to actually exist. But like, itni achi society, jitni achi society shayad possible hi nahi. So in Othio's, uh, in Othio, Ethiopian's vision, the peoples of the world are grouped as distinct nations, identified through their flags and national costume, leading the procession way past the Statue of Liberty are the United States and Switzerland, which by this time were already nation-states. France, identifiable by the revolutionary tricolor, has just reached the statue. She is followed by the people of Germany, bearing the black, red and gold flag. Interestingly, at the time when Soryu created this image, the German people did not yet exist as a united nation. The flag they carry is an expression of liberal hopes in 1848 to unify the numerous German-speaking principalities into nation statue, into nation state under a democratic constitution. Following the German people are the people of Austria, the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. Lombardy, Poland, England, Ireland, Hungary and Russia. From the heavens above, Christ, saints and angels gaze upon the scene. They have been used by the artist to symbolize fraternity. Fraternity means brotherhood among the nations of the world. So our first topic and one of the main topics in this chapter is the French Revolution and the idea of the nation. The first clear expression of nationalism came with the French Revolution in 1789. France was a full-fledged territorial state in 1789. Territorial state means it was in, under the influence of some other country. The political and constitutional changes that came in the wake of the French Revolution led to the transfer of sovereignty from monarchy to a body of French citizen. Monarchy means when one person is ruling over a whole state or over a whole country. The revolution proclaimed that it was the people who would henceforth constitute the nation and shape its destiny. The revolution was actually for uh, so that they can rule themselves and they would no longer remain under someone else's slavery. The French revolutionaries introduced various measures and practices that could create a sense of collective identity amongst the French people. The ideas of La Patrie, which means the fatherland, and Les Citoyen, which means the citizen, emphasize the notion, notion means idea, of a united community enjoying equal rights under a constitution. They wanted uh, an, indep an independent state as a a new French flag, the tricolor, was chosen to replace the formal royal standard. The Estates General was elected by the body of active citizens and renamed the National Assembly. The centralized administrative system 
was put in place and it formulated uniform laws for all citizens within its territory. Internal customs, duties and dues were abolished and a uniform system of weights and measures was adopted. Regional dialects, dialects means uh, languages which are spoken in a specific area or in a small community. Regional dialects were discouraged and French as it was spoken and written in Paris became the common language of the nation. The revolutionaries further declared that it was the mission and the destiny of the French nation to liberate the peoples of Europe from despotism. In other words, to help other peoples of Europe to become nations. That means to become independent. When the news of the events in France reached the different cities of Europe, students and other members of educated middle classes began setting up Jacobian clubs. Their activities and campaigns prepared the way for the French armies which moved into Holland, Belgium, Switzerland and much of Italy in the 1790s. With the outbreak of revolutionary wars, the French armies began to carry the idea of nationalism abroad. So now they wanted uh, this feeling of nationalism to be in everyone's mind and heart all over the world. Here you can see the map of Europe after the Congress of Vienna, that is 1815. Within the wide swathe of territory that became under his control, Napoleon set about introducing many of the reforms that he had already introduced in France. Through a return to monarchy, Napoleon had no doubt destroyed democracy in France, but in the administrative field, he had incorporated revolutionary principles in order to make the whole system more rational and efficient. The Civil Code of 1804, usually known as the Napoleon Code, did away with all privileges based on birth, established equality before the law, and secured the right to property. This code was exported to the regions under French control. In the Dutch Republic, in Switzerland, in Italy and Germany, Napoleon simplified administrative divisions, abolished the feudal system, and freed peasants, peasants are the farmers, from safedom and manorial dues. That means the extra taxes and all they had to pay, all the farmers were freed from those. In the towns too, guild restrictions were removed. Transport and communication systems were improved. Peasants, artisans, workers and new businessmen enjoyed a new found freedom. However, in the areas conquered, the reactions of the local population to French rule were mixed. Initially, in many places such as Holland and Switzerland, as well as in certain cities like Brussels, Mainz, Milan and Warsaw, the French armies were welcomed as harbingers of liberty. But the initial enthusiasm soon turned into hostility as it became clear that the new administrative arrangements did not go hand in hand with political freedom. Increased taxation, censorship, forced conscription into the French armies required to conquer the rest of the Europe all seemed to outweigh the advantages of administrative changes. That is, though they initially liked all those things, but later on they came to know that it was not actually good. Our second topic is the making of nationalism in Europe. Germany, Italy and Switzerland were divided into kingdoms, duchies and cantons whose rulers had their autonomous territories. Eastern and Central Europe were under autocratic monarchies. Monarchies I told you where a single person rules, for example a king rules, within the territories of which lived diverse people. They did not see themselves as sharing a collective identity or a common culture. The Habsburg Empire that ruled over Austria, Hungary, for example, was a patchwork of many different regions and peoples. It included the Alpine regions, the Tyrol, the Australia and Sudentland, as well as Bohemia. 
where the aristocracy was predominantly German speaking. It also included the Italian speaking provinces of Lombardy and Venetia. In Hungary, half of the population spoke Magyar, while the other half spoke a variety of dialects. In Galicia, the aristocracy spoke Polish. Besides these three dominant groups, there also lived within the boundaries of the empire a mass of subject peasant peoples, Bohemians and Slovaks, to the north, Slovenes in Carniola, Croats to the south, the Romans to the east in Transylvania. Such differences did not easily promote a sense of political unity. So basically there were sections among the peoples itself. The aristocracy and the new middle class. A landed aristocracy was the dominant class on the continent. The members of this class were united by a common way of life that cut across regional divisions. They owned estates in the countryside and also townhouses. They spoke French for purposes of diplomacy and in high society. Their families were often connected by ties of marriage. This powerful aristocracy was however numerically a small group. The majority of the population was made of the peasantry. Industrialization began in England in the second half of 18th century. But in France and parts of German states, it occurred only during the 19th century. In its wake, new social groups came into being. A working class population and middle class made up of industrialists, businessmen, professionals. In Central and Eastern Europe, these groups were similar, smaller in number till the 19th century. It was among the educated, liberal middle classes that ideas of national unity following the abolition of aristocratic privileges gained popularity. So this is an important point to note. Now, what did liberal nationalism stand for? The term liberalism derives from the Latin root liber and it means free. For the new middle classes, liberalism stood for freedom for the individual and equality of all before the law. A new conservatism after 1815. What is conservatism? A political philosophy that stressed the importance of tradition, established institutions and customs, and preferred gradual development to quick change. So they basically uh, emphasized on the importance of tradition, also established many institutions and customs, and they also preferred slow development but quick change. In 1815, representatives of the European powers, Britain, Russia, Prussia and Austria, who had collectively defeated Napoleon, met at Vienna to draw up a settlement for Europe. The delegates, delegates means the important people, the delegates drew up the Treaty of Vienna of 1815 with the object of undoing most of the changes that had come about in Europe during the Napoleon Wars. Now, Treaty of Vienna is one of the most important uh, thing in the world history. A series of states were set up on the boundaries of France to prevent French expansion in future. Thus, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, which included Belgium, was set up in the north and Genoa was added to Piedmont in the south. Prussia was given important new territories on its west frontiers. Frontiers means the boundary. So Prussia was given uh, territories near the western boundaries, while Austria was given control of northern Italy. But the German Confederation of 39 states that had been set up by Napoleon was left untouched. In the east, Russia was given a part of Poland, while Prussia was given a portion of Saxony. So this is how the Treaty of Vienna uh, went on by dividing various places and uh, allocating different places at different areas. So these were few important topics uh, in the lesson The Rise of Nationalism in Europe. We shall be continuing this in our part 2. See you until then.